Professor Rosas, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture organized at the Faculty of Law Administration at the Mickiewicz University in Poznań. I'm very pleased to host you within the walls of our university, uh, distinguished specialist in European law, Professor Alan Rosas, who will deliver a lecture entitled the European Court of Justice, Dual Roads Lead to Luxembourg. Today's meeting is part of the series of lectures in honor of Professor Krzysztof Skubiszewski, which aim to spread knowledge of the important issue of international law. Uh, this lecture is organized in cooperation with the foundation named after Professor Skubiszewski. Professor Krzysztof Skubiszewski was a professor of our faculty and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland, as well as uh, a respected lawyer and a diplomat with the, his academic achievements and public activities left a uh, lasting mark in our history. Today's event is also supported financially by the city of Poznań as part of the Academic Poznań program. Thanks to this initiative, we are able to continue our mission of developing cooperation with outstanding specialists from all over the world and promoting Poznań as a place conductive to the exchange of academic ideas and inspiring discussions. The subject of Professor Rosa's lecture is extremely timely and important for understanding the contemporary challenges of facing the European Union. The question of whether all roads lead to Luxembourg opens up a discussion on the role of the Court of Justice of the European Union in shaping European law and its impact on the EU member states. This is particularly relevant, especially in the context of the Europeans dynamically changing legal and political environment. The challenges Europe is facing today are having a major impact on the system of the European values, and these values are being tested and protected by, among others, the European Court of Justice. Professor Rosas, we are delighted that you, are, you, you have agreed to share your knowledge and experience with, with us, with our students, and uh, with our colleagues. On behalf of our academic community, of our university and faculty, I welcome you once again, and thank you for accepting our invitation. I wish you all inspiring lecture and fruitful discussions. Thank you very much, and now I'm pleased Ms. Agatha Hauser to have a speech. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's lecture, another lecture conducted in the series of lectures dedicated to the memory of Professor Krzysztof Skubiszewski. We are very proud of the legacy of Professor Skubiszewski and we want to keep his name in our memory, in our minds, and in our hearts. And I'm very happy that Professor Rosas agreed to join us in this endeavor, endeavor of commemorating uh, Professor Skubiszewski. Uh, today's lecture on the role of the Court of Justice of the EU will be presented by Professor Alan Rosas. And we are extremely happy to have such a distinguished specialist in the field speaking about the court. Uh, it is important to remember that Professor Rosas has served on the court for 17 years. And many groundbreaking cases we discuss during our lectures, during our classes, our students used in the thesis uh, were adopted with him on the bench and him participating in sculpturing our current understanding of some of the major EU principles. We have to remember that the role of the Court of Justice is not easy. It is a court that has to, uh, in a way, uh, agree on things that are different to agree on. There are many conflicting interests the court has to take into consideration. And it is incredible that throughout the process of functioning of the court, the Court of Justice of the EU has shaped the general principles, the rules related to protection of individuals, and the rules concerning the common market. Today's lecture is dedicated to the issue of the court's jurisdiction and its role vis-a-vis -vis national courts. And we have to remember that national courts 
are considered as part of the EU judiciary, and they are considered as national, uh, EU courts as well. So it will be interesting to listen about how this difficult relationship works in practice. Professor Rosas, we are very excited and very happy you are joining us here today, and we are looking forward to your speech. And without further ado, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much. I, <clears throat> I'm very happy after a long pause to be back in Poznan uh, as a director of the Finnish Institute for Human Rights. I was here at least a couple of times, but it was a long time ago. And I'm, I'm very happy also to see my, my friends, Professor Skenja and Bieroshevsky, in the audience. I'm not only happy, but I also feel very honored for having been invited to give the annual uh, Khrushchev Subishevsky uh, lecture. And I'm also happy to see members of his family honoring this occasion. Uh, he was, as we already heard, of course, a professor. This was his alma mater, uh, foreign minister, also an international judge, US uh, Iran claims tribunal, and uh, a great academic career. He was, of course, an internationally renowned uh, scholar of public international law with a particular interest in international organizations and their competencies and, and powers, including their mechanisms for peaceful settlement of international disputes. Today, as we have already heard, I will focus on the European Union and its judicial system. Uh, European Union, of course, as we all know, constitutes a very special uh, supranational organization. Uh, it, it has many names. Whether this is a good sign or bad sign, I'll leave, leave uh, aside for the moment. And of course, I will particularly focus on, on the judicial system, which constitutes, generally speaking, a more far-reaching system for the settlement of disputes than what is customary in intergovernmental contexts. And as the European Court of Justice has pointed out uh, many times, and one of the most important decisions, I would argue, is something called Opinion 109, which was given in 2011 on a uniform patent litigation system, where the court, in rather strong language, noted that the judicial system of the EU, as the court said, consists of two pillars, the two courts in Luxembourg and the national courts. And it encompasses on them both to see to it that the law is observed, as it said in the Union Treaty. Uh, the national court system, in fact, if you ask me, should be seen as the backbone of the whole system. The system doesn't function without the national courts. However, today I will more focus on the Court of Justice, but obviously, as um, was already suggested by Tata's introduction, it's difficult to make a sharp distinction between the two. They are all part of the same uh, system. Um, I will look at the court or courts in Luxembourg, not with mixed feelings, but on the basis of a mixed experience. I, I used to be a, a, a law professor in Turku, Finland, for quite some time. And it was in that capacity I also came to, to Poznan around 1990 or, or so. Uh, then, uh, after Finland became a, a member of the European Union, um, I was a first director and then deputy director general of the legal service of the European 
commission also appearing as a sort of almost as an advocate before the Court of Justice on behalf of, of the European Commission. And then as, as we already heard, as a judge for 17, 18 years. And currently, and I will say about, about that a little bit more later, I happen to be president of the so-called Article 255 panel uh, charged with assessing the suitability, as the legal text says, suitability of candidates to perform the duty of judge and advocate general of the Court of Justice and the General Court. So this obviously gives me a possibility to, to see who, who are my, or who are not my uh, successors at the, at the court. So <clears throat> when I look at the Court of Justice, it's probably based on a sort of a mix of, of, of these different experiences. Uh, <clears throat> as I'm sure many of you know, the EU judicial system provides for a variety of procedural remedies, uh, some of which are also open to actions by individuals, uh, such as we call them direct actions, notably actions for annulment and actions for actual seeking compensation for damage are limited to acts and failures to act of the union institutions in Brussels or Luxembourg or Strasbourg. If an individual is dissatisfied, if any of you is dissatisfied with the acts or omissions of national bodies, believing that they are in violation of EU law, there are basically two procedural avenues, as many as of you know, that can be explored. First, an action may be, of course, brought before a national court, uh, inviting it, if need be, to request a so-called preliminary ruling under Article 267 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union from the Court of, of Justice. And as from a few days ago, some of these preliminary rulings can also be sought from what is called the general court, the lower court, it used to be called court of first instance, but today it's a general court. For instance, value added tax, customs law, uh, air companies' uh, responsibility for, um, for um, failure to, to, to deliver a plane in time. Uh, and, and some other issues which have been transferred from the Court of Justice to the General Court that entered into force the 1st October. Uh, <clears throat> it is up to the national judge, and that's why the national judges are so important, to decide whether a preliminary ruling should be sought, and if so, what should be the questions. The parties can always suggest to the court we should ask this and this and this, but it's fin finally up to the judge to decide what will be sent to Luxembourg. Uh, <coughs> in um, uh, a judgment which is fairly recent, it's called Consortio, the European Court of, of Justice has ruled that um, if the court of last instance, which in principle has an obligation to ask these preliminary rulings, fails to do so even if one or both of the parties have so requested, uh, in that case at least it should give a reasoning of its uh, judgment. Uh, and uh, the same principle may today also follow from the recent case law of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg which is not an EU institution, formally speaking. It's sponsored by the Council of Europe, which consists of more than 40 member states, many more than on the European Union. The Strasbourg case law um, um, is based on the idea that the failure to provide reasoning for not asking a preliminary question, if it's a Supreme Court or other court of last instance, can lead to a violation of Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. That said, it has to be acknowledged that the preliminary ruling also has its limits. Um, the, um, the court in Luxembourg
Luxembourg is supposed only to interpret the law, uh, whereas the facts of the case and the national law should be decided by the national judge. And that uh, also uh, sometimes causes problems, uh, or at least the question, how much should the Court of Justice in Luxembourg say about something like, for instance, the situation in Poland, which I'm sure you are well aware, and how much should be le left to the national judge. And the Court of Justice also recently has refused, as many of you may have, have seen, to answer certain questions, saying that answering them is not necessary in order to solve a concrete dispute. But such situations also, of course, can arise with respect to other countries uh, than Poland. That's, that was a word about the uh, preliminary ruling. Uh, another remedy, of course, is what is called the infringement procedure. Um, and, um, and there it is normally up to the European Commission to decide whether such an action should be brought before the Court of Justice or not. So it can be Commission versus Poland, Commission versus Romania, Commission versus Finland, etc. Member states also have a possibility to bring cases against each other, but that's used very rarely. Uh, member states don't want to sort of criticize each other somehow. So it's normally the commission. Uh, <coughs> and um, such infringement cases, by the way, also can concern the question I already touched upon. In other words, the obligation in principle of court of last instance to ask for a preliminary ruling because we have now two judgments from Luxembourg, where first France in 2018, and very recently this year, United Kingdom were condemned because their Supreme Court did not ask a question, even if the court in Luxembourg thought that they should have. Why am I saying the United Kingdom? Have I not heard about Brexit? Well, this is because of the transitional period, so it was still possible uh, because this had happened during this transitional period, the refusal to, to, to send a, uh, uh, a request to, to Luxembourg. Uh, it's up to the European Commission to decide, and if it's a negative decision, the Commission maybe it has to be open, uh, openly admitted, maybe for political reasons, decides not to bring a case, or to bring a case, but if you have complained to the Commission and they don't bring, then obviously you would like to challenge that. But if you bring a case to Luxembourg, that will be declared inadmissible. So it's considered a free marginal appreciation of the Commission whether to bring a case or not. Um, since already quite some time, there has also been the possibility of financial sanctions if the judgment of the Court of Justice in an infringement case is not followed. Uh, just to give an example, in a recent case, Commission versus Hungary, the Court of Justice ordered the respondent state to pay, first of all, a lump sum of euro 200 million uh, euros. Uh, it's a kind of a fine. And then, a, as it's called, a penalty payment of altogether 1 million euro per day for the time that the violation continues. There's no upper limit in Article 260 of the TFEU. So in theory, we could talk about not hundreds of millions, but we could talk about billions. And what happens if the member state doesn't pay? In that case, uh, uh, the European Commission at least believes that it can use something which in French would be compensation in English, I, I think one normally speaks about offsetting. So in other words, the Commission would not pay agricultural subsidies or, or what have you to the state concerned up to the sum that the state should pay as a fine or penalty payment. Uh, this, of course, is very different from normal public international law uh, context like International Court of Justice and, and, and others who do not possess these kind of possibilities. Uh, <coughs> the 
availability and also frequent use of these procedural remedies, and I haven't mentioned them all, uh, explain at least partly why it's a generally held view, I would argue, that the Union courts, the Luxembourg courts, play an important role in the workings of the EU and in shaping what could be called its constitutional structure. Uh, the Court of Justice has, in fact, contributed. It's maybe the only one, but I think its contribution may be the most important one to something that we could call the constitutionalization of the European Union from being an international organization to a constitutional system. I know everybody would not agree with this, so this is a personal uh, view. Together with the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank, the Union courts can be seen as part of a more federal, or if you prefer, federative branches of the EU. As compared to the EU Council of Ministers, or Council, it's the official name, the European Council, which is the summit of heads of state and government, and inter intergovernmental cooperation between the 27 member states. Um, but have the two courts in Luxembourg become so important that you could say that all roads lead to Luxembourg? I'll come back to that at the end. Let me instead now make a small excursion to the United States and the status of the U.S. Supreme Court in particular. Why I have picked the U.S. Supreme Court uh, there are considerable differences between American federalism and the European integration process. The latter, of course, being of a much more recent origin and still displaying some more intergovernmental features, notably in the area of the common foreign and security policy, very often um, abbreviated as CFSP. Uh, however, the constitutional significance and dynamism of the case law of these two courts also offer interesting points of comparison. As early as 1835, so we go really back in time, Alexis de Tocqueville, a well-known observer of the U.S. constitutional system in his Democracy in America, described the Supreme Court in the following terms, and I will quote, in the hands of seven federal judges, today they are nine, but this was 1835, rest unceasingly the peace, prosperity, the very existence of the Union. Without them, the Constitution is a dead letter. To them, the executive power appeals in order to resist the encroachments of the legislative body. The legislative to defend itself against the undertakings of the executive power the Union to make the states obey, the states to repulse the ex exaggerated pretensions of the Union, public interest against private interest, the spirit of conservation against democratic instability. That power is immense, but it is a power of opinion. Uh, end of quotation. That was the US Supreme Court. It was not the European Court of, of Justice. But the question, of course, is if the Tocqueville were to study democracy in Europe today, well, first of all, I'm sure he would find a lot, lot of problems. But could he argue that the role he described to the US Supreme Court is now shared or even taken over by the European Court of Justice? If the comparison is made between the US constitutional system in the first half of the 19th century, that is before the Civil War, uh, and the EU situation of today, one would be tempted to say, at least I would be, that the Luxembourg courts play a more important role than the Supreme Court, but then a long time ago. Why is this? This is because, particularly before the American Civil War, the US constitutional system including respect for the rulings of the Supreme Court, was in fact quite fragile, despite what the Tocqueville was saying. 
the sub-federal states, it's the United States of America, uh, so it's a union of states. The sub-federal states and their courts often declined, more often than member states of the union today, to follow decisions and rulings from Washington. There were a lot of rebellions even before the Civil War, and then of course you have even the Civil War when some of them tried to, to leave. It was only gradually that the federal government and the federal courts managed to assert their predominance. Today, the US constitutional system, while still being debated with regard to the relationship between the sub-federal states and the union and the question of ultimate sovereignty, um, demonstrates, after all, a more stable nature than that of the EU which is still constantly on the move and the subject of fierce debates, also political ones. The initial EEC treaty, the Treaty of Rome of 1957, is a curious blend of general principles and objectives and more detailed provisions with many questions left unanswered in the texts of the treaty. The subsequent treaty developments with the single European Act, the treaties of Maastricht, Amsterdam, Nice, and last but not least, Lisbon, have certainly clarified some issues, but many questions have been left to the case law, and some of them still await clarification. The result is that the European Court of Justice is still today faced with a constitutionally fussy collection of values principles, objectives, and rules of various sorts, some very general, others quite detailed and also technical in nature. Especially concerning the general values, principles, and objectives, in short, the constitutional structure, there is a pluralism of opinions on how to interpret and apply these norms or how to develop them in the future. The court, whether it likes it or not, uh, is not only confronted with economic, administrative, and technical questions, but has to perform the functions of the constitutional court as well. Two days ago, I heard the president of the court uh, of justice in a public speech say that the court of justice is sort of a combination of constitutional court and supreme court. You can express this relationship also in other ways, but that's at least what he said. What are the features inherent in the Luxembourg Court's tasks that explain why the union judicial system and the role of the Court of Justice in particular has assumed such a crucial role? I already mentioned uh, the uh, significance of procedural remedies which go much beyond what you have in public international law contexts. Uh, but the importance of these remedies, it goes without saying, also hinges on the scope, nature, and content of the legal rules to be applied. If you have very few limited number of legal rules, you're uh, role will obviously be more limited. And in this respect, as I'm sure you all have somehow at least detected, we have seen a re remarkable development. The integration process started quite modestly with the supranational management of coal and steel production, but after this series of treaty and treaty amendments, it extends today to what I would say is practically all, uh, all areas of law, including, even if to a limited extent, the common defense policy, which was completely uh, impos impossible to imagine uh, 20 or 30 years ago. If we compare the areas of community competence before the Treaty of Maastricht of 1992, with the areas of the exclusive, shared, parallel, coordinating, and supplementary competence of the Union following from Maastricht, uh, Amsterdam, Nice, and the Treaty of Lisbon, we will realize that the last 30 years or so have brought about radical change. One factor contributing
contributing to this development has been the emergence, as from 1969, famous uh, judgment in Stauder versus City of Ulm of EU fundamental rights, uh, of EU's own fundamental rights, so to speak, and the development culminating, of course, in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which entered into force in 2009. True, the Union has to respect the principle of conferral, under which, to quote from Article 5, Paragraph 2 of the Union Treaty, the Union shall act only within the limits of the competence conferred upon it by the member states to attain the objectives set out therein. But if we look at the two treaties, TEU and TFEU, and all the protocols, which are also what is called EU primary law, and then this more than 100,000 pages of secondary law, directives, regulations, and, and so on, we realize that a lot has already been so confirmed. From a more limited beginning consisting mainly of the four economic freedoms, competition and state aid law and agriculture, the remit of union law already in the 1970s and 1980s started to expand inter alia to social affairs, environmental protection, transport, energy, taxation, and so on. And from the beginning, the common principles, objectives, and rules providing for a union com competence have in most cases been interpreted by the Court of Justice. It should certainly be recognized that the nature of union competence varies and is in some cases of a secondary nature, as it probably also should be. Yet, also the rules on supplementary competence, as it's called in EU jargon, or competence to coordinate member states' policies may require interpretation by the union courts. The area of economic policy where union competence is weaker than with, with respect to monetary policy with the euro, welcome as soon as possible Poland, um, offers an example, especially the distinction between economic and monetary policy, where's the line to draw between them? has been elucidated in important case law of the Union Court, uh, judgments in Pringle, Gauweiler, and Weiss, the two last mentioned concerning certain rulings of the German Constitutional Court. Apart from monetary and economic policy, as examples of areas of Luxembourg case law, which would have been almost unthinkable before the Treaty of Maastricht, can be mentioned the sub-areas of the so-called area of freedom, security, and justice. That is, asylum and immigration law, judicial cooperation in civil matters, and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. These subjects, and in particular, asylum and, and immigration, as well as criminal law in particular, manifestly concerned issues that used to be reserved for states and national sovereignty. Yet the common rules are by now quite detailed and judgments rendered by the European Court of Justice almost a daily occurrence in this field. It's a quantitatively the most important area of the case law of the court. Without here going into that case law in any greater detail, one of the more general observations that can be made is that, is that this case law According, uh, uh, sorry, including in the uh, in the less controversial sub area of judicial cooperation in civil matters, tends to reinforce the idea already reflected in the treaties and secondary law that there is a marked difference between external and internal borders. The treaties even refer to the area of freedom, security, and justice is an internal com concept, uh, as well as to the internal market, which is the old economic single market, as area, and I quote, without internal frontiers. Well, it's not completely true. There are some internal frontiers. But uh, that is the objective that the treaty sort of um, declares. There should be no internal frontiers. 
the case law of the Court of Justice has further underscored the distinction between the internal and the external. Another observation of a general nat nature concerning this area of freedom, security, and justice is the particular relevance and importance here of fundamental rights as recognized in the EU Charter. And also, there's a lot of case law, some quite controversial, related to discrimination. There are two important EU directives on discrimination of, of, um, 2000, of the year 2000, and uh, uh, they have given rise to a lot of case law, including on such issues that can you be forced not to use a headscarf in the workplace and, and other uh, uh, issues. Can, can uh, somebody working for a, for a religious or a hospital owned by a religious community be fired for not uh, uh, being a, a member of that same religion? And many, many other uh, things of this nature. I remember when this case law started after 2000, there were some member states and also professors who said, how, how, wh how can you go into this question of discrimination? Well, the answer, of course, was that there were two new directives. If the member states didn't want this, why did they enact this directive? It's not the European Court that provides directives. It's, it's a, normally the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament together. The concept of EU, EU citizenship is another example where also you had a little bit the same uh, situation that some member states or some, some law professors or politicians criticized the Court of Justice, that's already some time ago, for starting to deal with European citizenship. But the answer, of course, was that it had been included in the Treaty of Maastricht. Then some, some professors, including a well-known Danish professor, uh, said that, yeah, but the Court of Justice should have understood that this was never seriously meant. It was just inserted to please Spain, which was advocating European citizenship. So you shouldn't take this as binding. But something which is in the treaty, funnily enough, the Court of Justice thinks is normally binding. So you see that um, <coughs> this treaty developments, all, not always, but very often, are, are behind the, the fact that the court then starts to deal with it. So the answer is quite simple in that sense. Why, why does the court mingle with these situations? Because they have been included in the treaty or in a directive, and then there are private parties who start, and there are advocates who start to, to advocate them. Speaking about citizenship, the EU treaty says that uh, nationality is a matter for the member states, uh, and then everybody who's a national of a member state uh, is a EU citizen. But that, of course, means that if you lose your national nationality, you also lose your EU citizenship. And that has led the, the court, for some people very controversially, to say that it means that there are some checks and balancing also on your what you do with nationality. You can't arbitrarily deprive people of their national nationality. Why? Because then they will lose their EU citizenship. And, and already in an old case, Grelchik, uh, from I think 2001, if I remember correctly, the court said that union citizenship constitutes, and now I quote, the fundamental status of nationals or member states, and not something that should be, well, this is my own, and not something that should be discarded easily. I talked about the distinction between the internal and the external. And speaking or, or taking a look at the external, EU external relations that I was myself as a director in the Commission Legal Service responsible for seven or so years, have developed considerable since the 1990s. There is an abundance of case law on union external competence, for instance, whether it is exclusive, shared, or parallel competence, and on the procedures to follow when entering into international agreements. The union, as you may know, entered into thousands of in 
international agreements, and not only concerning trade, but concerning a whole range of different issues. While member states still retain some freedom of action, uh, and, and they all want to have their own foreign policy, the space for this space for national maneuver has been to some extent limited through developments in written law, but probably also in case law. The Luxembourg court has also been called upon to control the exercise of the EU councils and parliaments, decision-making powers, particularly within the field of EU sanctions in the TFEU called restrictive measures. And the many sanctions packages against Russia, of course, is an example. But there are sanctions of similar nature taken against Syria, Iran, many African countries. And there's a long list, in fact. Uh, while the court has recognized some special characteristics of the common foreign and security policy, uh, it has in the same time limited the room for upholding uh, differences between these TFSP affairs and other areas of EU law. Uh, and um, uh, this has, among other things, also in included the court interpreting its own jurisdiction in a rather more extensive way. And I can't go into details, but in a recent judgment, uh, KS and KD versus Council and others from 10th September this year, uh, the court said that, in, if I simplify a little bit, that um, respect to, to these CFSP matters, the court has jurisdiction because of the principle of the rule of law uh, and effective judicial protection, except when it's dealing with um, political or strategic choices made within the framework of the CFSP. So there's now for CFSP matters a sort of political question doctrine that we know from the United States. Uh, <coughs> as is well known, the emphasis on the rule of law and effective judicial protection is not limited to external relations, but has become a central feature of recent case law more generally. Uh, the, the judgment that opened the door, as many of you will be aware, uh, uh, and, um, and, and the wider use of the concept of the rule of law as expressed in Article 2 of the Union Treaty and the principle of effective judicial protection expressed in Article 19.1 of the TEU and also in the Charter of Fundamental Rights was the so-called Portuguese judge's salary case of 2018, uh, where the court said that uh, even if it's not necessarily a question of a concrete uh, application of EU law, uh, this principle of effective judicial protection may be relevant also for all courts which generally deal with EU law questions. And if you can mention one national court which never deals with any EU law question, uh, please tell me so. I, I can't think of, of any. Uh, <clears throat> so that means that, that that really sort of opened the door for a wider use. And the result, of course, is that now have all this very well-known case law concerning Poland, but also concerning Romania, uh, Malta, and, and, and Hungary, etc. cetera. Um, the principle of uh, the primacy of union law, uh, which you could say is has been vigorously defended by the Union courts, has, of course, met with resistance from some national courts. The Polish Constitutional Tribunal, of course, being the most uh, well-known, perhaps, or most radical example. Uh, <clears throat> there was a lot written about the vice judgment of the German uh, Federal Constitutional Court. Again, I can't go into 
details, but on that point, uh, you could say that even the end result, perhaps even to some extent, reinforced primacy rather than the other way around. The, the German court, uh, in a new composition, you can say almost backtracked and say that after the European Central Bank had posted some documents on, on its website, it was now satisfied that the European Central Bank decision was okay, and so there was no reason to inter in, 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 intervene. And the Commission, after all, started an infringement case against Germany, uh, but the German government then wrote to the Commission and made a commitment to apply the principle of primacy and more or less between the lines saying that it didn't agree with the wise judgment of its own constitutional court. Well, this is, uh, of course, only one example of, of many. Uh, <coughs> the situation is obviously not free from problems. Uh, there are these uh, um, actions from some national courts, some either Supreme Court or Constitutional Court that had questioned at least an absolute primacy. Um, <coughs> I'm always trying to underline that primacy is not uh, because EU institutions or EU judges should necessarily be more clever than national judges or national institutions. Primacy has a very simple reason. If you need common rules, you must have rules in common. If, you have, uh, if national law prevails, you will end up with 27 different rules. And there's no point in having a European Union having 27 different rules. It's a rule-making machine, whether you like it or not. And um, it can only function on the basis of primacy whether it will be killed if there is uh, one or two judgments from this and that national court, that's another matter. There can be exceptional situations and so on. But generally speaking, uh, I think it's simply a, a sort of a must for the European Union to function. It could not function without that principle. It's nothing radical. It's something that, that really is necessary. Uh, well, again, these are my personal uh, remarks. Um, last but not least, um, what is my answer to the title of the lecture? Well, uh, I think you already have realized, and it can't come as a big surprise, that I would say no, not all roads obviously lead to Luxembourg, and if you ask me, they should not either. There must be room for political decision-making. Uh, there must also be rule for national competence in many areas. There's no need for the Union to, to regulate, at least in detail, all possible areas. Um, the most important parameters for the Court of Justice, I would still argue, are set by the basic treaties, not by the Court itself, uh, which in most cases can be established and amended only by the unanimous approval of the member states. And secondary law often enacted by the EU Council and the European Parliament together continues to play a crucial role in shaping and regulating the development of the integration uh, process. But certainly you could say that many roads seem to lead to Luxembourg and uh, at least when I was on the bench, and even more so after that, I don't think that was necessarily a huge desire. The, the court has too many cases to deal with per year. It's not the court that decides whether it's uh, seized of a case or, or not. Uh, <coughs> but um, um, it simply faced with these different expectations and legal texts and so on, and is trying to make the best of a difficult situation. Uh, and I, I, I would um, end by once again uh, quoting 
Alexis de Tocqueville, but again we are going back to 1835. So the federal judges must be not only good citizens, learned and upright men, qualities necessary for all magistrates, but they must also be statesmen. They must know how to discern the spirit of the times, to brave the obstacles that can be overcome and to change direction when the current threatens to carry away with them the sovereignty of the Union and the obedience to its laws. Well, I'm not at all arguing that the, court, that the judges of the Court of Justice, including former judges, are statesmen. But I think they perform a, an important role, whether we like it or not. And, and, um, um, and so from that point of view, maybe something of what the Tecqueville is saying about the expectations of a judge of the US Supreme Court could also be applied for the European Court of Justice. Thank you very much for your patience.